at the University of Edinburgh in, in Scotland and is also a general practitioner with um, many years spending in researching the use of technologies and how they can improve access to health, health services. Before I hand over to Brian, I just would like to uh, mention a couple of uh, technical uh, issues. So, um, uh, you, you've seen in the outline that this webinar will, uh, is organized for one hour, so we, we will allow um, 30 minutes uh, for presentation for Brian and then we will have um, the moderated uh, Q&A session. So please keep your questions um, to the end. You also have the chat function available in case uh, you know something um, doesn't go uh, doesn't go well or you can't hear properly or you have some immediate comments. But uh, yeah, for the questions, we would appreciate if you can leave it uh, till the end. And also, um, just for the uh, in terms of um, um, I would say convenience for all of us, if I can ask all of you to uh, to mute, uh, and then obviously once we get to the Q and A session, we can all get um, unmuted again. So without without further ado, I will pass to uh, to Brian to kick off the presentation. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, joining me this morning. Um, so in the very short time we have, I'm going to give a brief overview of telehealth, focusing on two conditions, COPD and hypertension. Uh, I picked them because I think they exemplify the challenges of providing evidence, both of efficacy and implementation. But more importantly, I think they illustrate how we can overcome the sort of challenges that sometimes these things throw up. So in passing, I'll mention some of the inconsistencies that different types of evaluation throw up, particularly in relation to the impact on patients' lives of these technologies, ending with how we should move forward. So the lecture is called um, Telehealth, Hype, Hubris and Hope, and many of you will be familiar with the hype cycle. And it's a graphical representation developed by Gartner for representing the initial uh, presentation experience and final adoption of new technologies starts off with a period of over optimism and high expectation followed by a period of disappointment and finally integration of innovation that's particularly opposite for telehealth and I, I just placed on this graph where we are with the various different conditions so at the moment, asthma is pretty much in the trough of disillusionment as a COPD, although um, high blood pressure and diabetes are looking as though they're beginning to come up to a point where they are going to be mainstreamed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the drivers to telehealth today, the failures of evidence and implementation, how we learn from setbacks and how we can move forward on this. So what are the main drivers for this? Well, the main driver, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is that we have an aging population and that this aging population um, is naturally becoming more ill. The older you get, the more likely you are to have a chronic illness. And in fact, uh, in, in the UK in particular, in the next 10 years, we expect the number of people with chronic illness to double. So clearly the ways that we've managed this up until now have, are not going to work. So um, we just don't have enough people. Um, so if we uh, think about the solutions, the main solution that's been put forward to this management of chronic um, disease management has been one of telemetrically supported supervised self-monitoring. And um, the policy background for this is quite interesting because um, it, it, it was very, very strongly um, touted by a variety of different organizations including um, the uh, European Union, um, the, uh, the World Health Organization. And in fact, in the UK here, we actually had a very, very strong um, focus on it from our own prime minister. This was following um, a very large implementation of telehealth in England, where he says the trial that has been a huge success and now ready to roll this out nationwide. Um, it was a pity he didn't actually wait for the results of that, which we'll hear later on, but um, the, the hype is all there. And in the academic background, if we look at COPD, um, the initial academic background was really very good. So we've got home telemonitoring of respiratory conditions results in early identification of deteriorations. And despite caveats, the reports are very positive. And uh, home telehealth was found to reduce rates of hospitalization and emergency department visits. 
The big problem here was that we weren't quite sure what we were talking about. And it was quite important to check the intervention. So here are four studies in, in which uh, pe people were find positive findings for telehealth. But the problem is that it wasn't just telehealth. Um, and Burbo actually provided what was really pulmonary rehabilitation along with their telehealth. And we know that pulmonary rehabilitation on its own is effective. So it's difficult to be sure which bit of this was actually effective. And uh, Toledo CASAS, they um, applied a whole network of support. So um, physicians on call, um, specialist nurses were all involved in providing the intervention along with telehealth. Um, and again, the whole system demonstrated the one which uh, our prime ex-prime minister was talking about so warmly, again provided a great deal of community matrons who um, provided a, a part of the intervention as well as telehealth. And all of these were being compared just with straightforward management of COPD by general practitioners. Um, so it was, it was actually be difficult to be sure whether it was telehealth alone or not that caused this uh, improvement. And in fact, this was the sort of conclusion that was withdrawn. And this is perhaps the most positive review of COPD telehealth, uh, one of the systematic reviews from Susanna McLean, um, showing that in fact, it did seem to have an effect, but that these were very complex interventions of which telehealth was only a part. And the most successful were as part of integrated care programs. So um, we needed to find out whether telehealth was making the difference or not. And I'm going to talk about the Telescop program, which is one I was involved with, because it was a bit of a landmark study in this regard. So the idea behind this was that um, the telehealth, the Telescop project was going to try and compare um, people getting exactly the same type of intervention, but one group had additional telehealth. So in other words, um, we provided additional care to the control group as well. So this worked um, very simply. A patient sat at home and completed a symptom score and did their pulse oximetry. This went to a remote server and then there was a monitoring service which looked at this every day and it varied from place to place. Sometimes it was community respiratory teams, sometimes long-term condition nurses, sometimes it was a call handler who looked at this and then phoned a general practitioner. However, each of these had a, a control which provided exactly the same service. Patients were asked to complete certain questions every day and they were given a score based on that. And if the score uh, uh, exceeded a certain level, then they were, they were contacted. They also did pulse oximetry and this gave quite rich data, but as you can see here, and um, you probably find uh, we'll discuss this later on. This varied a great deal, and I think it's that's an important uh, thing to remember. So, if we have this underpinning theory about how um, telemonitoring for COPD works, it means that by keeping the symptom diary and taking physiological measurements, it's possible to predict serious deteriorations leading to hospital admissions. In addition, by detecting these early and with judicious use of antibiotics and steroids, these admissions can be prevented. So that was the underpinning theory behind telehealth. Now, in our randomized controlled trial, we have clinical care and telemonitoring plus clinical care. There were 127 people in each group. And the primary outcome was time to first admission after this. These, these were a group of people who were at high risk of admission. They'd been previously been admitted in the, uh, in the last year. And we looked at a whole variety of other outcomes as well, which I won't go into today. But in terms of the results, there was actually no difference between the two groups in terms of time to first admission. Uh, the telehealth um, did not seem to make a difference to that. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve, which was pretty much the same thing. At first we thought perhaps we need to give this time to bed in and these were separating, but even if we chopped off the first two months, it still didn't make a difference to this. And if we looked at other uh, outcomes like um, quality of life, um, hospital anxiety and depression, 
um, there did not appear to be any difference either. But then this was, but it was quite interesting this because when you asked patients, you actually got a very different answer. And this is a quotation from a patient. It's like having someone sitting beside you. It's saying, we'll go this way. It's like another arm in your body saying, we'll do this. It's been a brilliant thing as far as I'm concerned. So people feeling really quite a bit reassured by this. Um, and then we looked at self-efficacy, knowledge about COPD or medication adherence. And again, they did not seem to show any difference. But again, when you spoke to patients, it's great to know that you can just take a seat reading and say, well, I do need a doctor. I do need to start these steroids. And certainly the impression we got from people was that this did seem to be an empowering thing and that they did seem to learn more about their condition, but it did not show up in the questionnaires that we used. However, there were a group of patients who took a different approach. In a way, it was a relief thinking I should ignore my own thoughts or getting a doctor. This organization was going to get a hold of a doctor if they're reading should I need a doctor. So this was exactly what we didn't want. This was someone who was actually just handing over all management to the, the team and not really considering their own management at all. So, but the big difference here that we discovered and one that was most worrying were the number of alerts. So this was obviously the control group. There were no alerts from the system. But in the, uh, in the group that had telehealth, there were 2,314 alerts. This is in a subgroup in which we had really good data. And uh, this resulted in 112 home visits, which didn't happen with this group. And if we added in um, visits and telephone calls which weren't associated with alerts, we'll see that that remains high in that group. So this group were, uh, who had telehealth had in some way come put their heads above the parapet, they were noticed by, um, by the care of the clinicians and they tended to spend more time with them. So overall, a big increase in community resources. And it's not surprising then that we got comments like this. I've never felt so well looked after in my life. I think it's a godsend. Uh, it's, it's not really very surprising that they thought that. Um, if we looked at the costs overall, um, the, uh, it, it was, the total costs were uh, more expensive for the uh, telehealth group than they were for the control group. Uh, these were largely based on hospital admissions. But the, this difference actually isn't significant. So what happened after that? So um, when, when, we, um, when we published these data, it actually produced a, a huge impact on the rollout of uh, telehealth across the world, really. So um, we absolutely ended up in the sloth of despair here. Uh, and the, the, do we just give up and uh, go home? And of course we don't. If you're in business or academia, you know from, you learn more from failure than you do from success. Everybody involved in this trial, clinicians, patients, academics, could see the potential for the technology. And we, we wanted to try and find out what went wrong and to make it better. Um, one of the problems with a traditional randomized controlled trial is that, the, um, is that the intervention is effectively fossilized at the start. And so there were things that we discovered really um, at the beginning that we perhaps could have done better, but were really uh, unable to change. Uh, and some of the reasons it may have gone wrong were that perhaps this was the wrong target group. Should we have been targeting people who were maybe a bit sicker, people who've just been discharged from hospital, perhaps it would have been who were at even higher risk of admission. Some hospital admissions are inevitable. The UK has the smallest number of hospital beds in the OECD, um, apart from one other country, I think. So it's... Um, People are only admitted as a last resort to hospital here in the UK. So it could well be that there was a ceiling effect here, that it was very, very difficult to make a difference. And finally, the algorithm that we, that we used, that I talked about earlier, the scoring algorithm. We felt very strongly that this may well be at fault. So if we have a look at this in a bit more detail, um, this, remember, this was the algorithm that we used, and this was based on literature. Um, people had kept paper diaries, and they had made associations between these symptoms and signs and, and admission to hospital. Um, and if we looked at um, 
the symptoms and the decisions to start uh, antibiotics, you can see from this that it looks pretty reasonable. Um, the top line, the bottom line is the symptoms and the top line, the blue line, is the uh, decision to start antibiotics. And you can see here, the um, it seems to fit quite nicely, the person has symptoms and then they start the antibiotics. And here we have it all along here. But we discovered that this was true only in 25% of patients. In 50% of patients, they had a kind of rolling pattern of exacerbations where they were uh, almost continuously on antibiotics. And um, sometimes some patients just comp completely overrode those symptoms that they had. And um, there was no connection between symptoms and decisions to take antibiotics. And when they asked patients, they'd say, you think it would be find it easy to tell when you're ill, but it's only afterwards that you, you know you're not well. They find it very, very hard to tell the difference between a bad day and the start of an exacerbation but they felt the technology was really great. They felt it really helped them. And their carers too were very happy about it. I don't worry about it the same as I used to. It's all taken care of before it can get to that level. That machine can tell him he's ill even before he knows it himself. If we look at pulse oximetry, which was the other thing that we made decisions on, um, we, we looked at, again, a subgroup here, 171 exacerbations from 18 subjects to see how helpful pulse oximetry was in determining whether someone was going to have an exacerbation or not. And we looked at the change in pulse oximetry two days before and two days after uh, when people had an exacerbation, and that was defined by their decision to start antibiotics or steroids. And as so we can see here, that pulse, the oxygen saturation fell slightly before that, but it only fell by 1.2 percent, so it's a very small fall. The heart rate rose um, by around about six and a half beats um, per minute. But when you remember, and it, the interesting thing is that although the change in oxygen saturation occurred before the decision to take antibiotic treatment, the change in pulse actually occurred after antibiotic treatment, which is very strange. And when you look at this graph I showed you at the start, which shows you the variation in pulse rate and oxygen saturation that you, you might expect in a, just day to day in a patient, you can see how difficult it is to make decisions based on something as simple as pulse oximetry as to whether someone is getting worse or not. So the whole thing began to be a bit worrying about whether the, the criteria on which we based the whole of telemonitoring was flawed. So um, it might be very easy to give up again, but we have chosen not to. And there are ways around this because we need to improve this algorithm. One way is to change the symptom score. And this is some people have been working on Exact Pro, which looks at a large number of uh, symptoms which might possibly predict um, exacerbations. These are much better than the ones we were using. But of course, you can't ask people to complete 23 questions every day. So we're some people are working on reducing that to make it more accurate. Um, you can change the algorithm. And one of the things that um, telehealth does really, really well is provide you with lots and lots of data. And so we were able to look back over the telehealth set, data set to see if we could improve things. So the, the previous algorithm we were using um, had a false positive rate um, of um, almost equivalent to its positive rate. So we were getting an area under the curve of slightly more than 0.5. It's a bit unfair that it was slightly better than chance um, that we were getting using that algorithm. Now, using machine learning, which tries to find a, a method, um, tries to find a different algorithm, looking at lots and lots of different ways of putting these data together to find something that is more accurate, we were able to improve this quite considerably. So um, the false positive rate was reduced quite considerably, but still the area under the curve is still 0.76, which still would result in quite a lot of false positive results. However, we have looked also at the ability to predict exacerbations rather than hospital admissions, and that is considerably better. And we're able to predict uh, exacerbation with an accuracy of 0.92 one head, day ahead and 0.85 three days ahead. So this is something we're working on at the moment. So there is hope here. <coughs> Excuse me. Other things we could do is look at different physiological measures. So 
resting respiratory rate is one of the things we've been looking at here in Edinburgh. This is someone's uh, recovery from an exacerbation. And there is a potential there to use respiratory rate, which can be managed at home, possibly along with other parameters to give us some ideas to whether maybe someone is beginning to get worse. And other uh, parameters such as um, uh, activity may also be a good way of looking at it and, and symptoms like simply like tiredness. So one of the other things we can consider do is changing the focus. So rather than the clin clinician facing um, results, we actually change that towards patients. And we, we've experimented with light touch telehealth systems in which the patients keep their own uh, results that they, they are not routinely reviewed by clinicians and, uh, and they own the patient self manages according to um, a, a program that they've already been given in advance. And only when that is not working do they contact the clinician. So the patient um, makes use of their, their own symptom score and oximetry to do that. And we find that that's been quite effective. Um, the, uh, we didn't do a trial on this. It was an observational study, but it was quite interesting that the patients themselves preferred this system and also that, that the um, doctors and nurses, some of them were complaining that the patients weren't getting in touch with them as often as they ought to. So this is how it works. Um, so the patient um, completes a symptom score, it goes to the internet, but nobody's looking at it. Uh, they follow their management plan. They only contact the doctor as needed, and then the doctor can get in touch um, to look at how things have changed over the last few days and can give advice accordingly. So um, these are the things that we've been doing in, in COPD. And I'm going to talk very, very briefly about hypertension monitoring, which is altogether a much bigger success story. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the randomized controlled trials that have taken place in hypertension telemonitoring, they seem to suggest very, very strongly that telemonitoring reduces blood pressure um, based on how uh, that change in blood pressure is likely to impact on heart disease and stroke. Um, Kwamba and his colleagues have calculated that it is also cost effective. So why should people measure blood pressure at home? It's the second commonest reason for attending in primary care. In Scotland, which is just a population of 5 million, 1.2 million appointments are for nothing but measuring blood pressure. And we know that measurements taken in surgeries are inaccurate compared with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and home monitoring, and they're a poor predictor of future pathology. Um, around about uh, you know, a fifth of the people um, don't actually have high blood pressure, they have white coat um, hypertension and home monitoring can detect that. So why aren't we doing it? So um, BP monitoring is relatively inexpensive, so it costs, if you're just watching someone twice a year, it's around about 35, 40 pounds. So primary care may not directly see the benefit of this because the the benefits of this are seen as a result of preventing admission to hospital in secondary care. And one of the big problems that didn't take off was because it involved third party websites, different logons, and it wasn't part of natural data management flow. And so doctors find it quite hard to fit in with their routine practices. So we've actually adopted a new system, which is Scale Up BP in which the patient takes their readings and enters a symptom score. It goes by mobile broadband to internet and they are given an automatic um, response saying um, whether the blood pressure is controlled or maybe slightly out of control, but not to worry about it, or if it's very, very high indeed, to, to repeat it and contact the doctor or nurse if it's still high. Um, but rather than having someone sitting um, looking at this every day or every week, uh, what happens is that the system produces a report um, which goes to the doctor, um, and that can go either every month, every three months, every six months, depending on how well the patient is controlled. And then the doctor can get in touch remotely with the patient to advise on change in therapy. So that works quite well with systems which are not acute. So it would be less likely to work with COPD or heart failure, but it works really well for diabetes and blood pressure. And this is the type of report the GP gets. And of course, this is considerably better than the sort of information they get from a twice daily um, 
a, a, twi a twice yearly visit to the doctor. And as you can see up here, they have, um, it's very, very clear what the target is and whether or not the patient is actually hitting um, that target. So one of the other things I think is worth looking at and uh, an area that we've become quite interested in is the use of patient recorded outcomes for review. So in other words, the patient records the symptoms and physiological measures. They are uploaded, so they usually self-manage. We move away from acute daily monitoring. So when you go along for a review, say on your rheumatism or uh, blood pressure, the doctor has this information, but they're not sitting waiting for it to come in. And so a lot of the questions that you would normally ask the patient have been asked in advance. So this is uh, this moving away from acute monitoring to self-management and uh, for uh, cold monitoring of patients at, at um, routine uh, appointments is, is the way I think that telehealth is going to go in the future. So in moving forward, I think we'll be probably using more artificial intelligence to manage as well as monitor people. Um, we haven't got enough doctors and nurses in the world to carry on managing people as we have before. I think they'll become increasingly individually tailored and uh, they will be patient facing. Of course, there are problems with this that um, there are difficulty about maintaining quality. The industry may have concerns about liability and we may need to change legislation to do this. So in the future, we may have something like this where someone would take their readings, it would go to an AI entity, it would give reminders to self-monitor, but it would also advise on change in treatment. And only if that work doesn't work is a, con a clinician contacted and uh, they get in touch with the patient. And then moving ahead, we never know that this is the digital phenotype, which is even further than this. At the moment, everything we do is monitored in some sort of way um, with Fitbits, with what, how we um, respond to people on Facebook and uh, Twitter um, and what we read and what we look up on the internet and to an extent what we do in the house in terms of movement and things we listen to, the programs we watch, um, our weight all being stored centrally. So it's quite possible at some point in the future that um, we could have an artificial intelligence entity that would be able to take a look at some of the readings from these types of things and start saying to us, well, um, you know, you're more breathless at the top of that hill. The camera on your computer seems to suggest you're looking a little pale and you've been looking up internet sites on constipation. Perhaps you should be getting your full blood count checked by your clinician, or it may say you're not going out as much. You haven't been on your website talking to your friends as much. You're listening to sad music on Spotify and they'll be offering you some sort of counselling. But um, so hopefully that's not going to happen too soon because I can imagine it will generate a fair bit of work for uh, clinicians like myself. So in conclusion, telehealth care is and will become an important means of managing long term illness. It will increasingly be patient facing and integrate multiple sources of information. It will make use of automated methods of monitoring and management. Progress will be incremental with many setbacks. And I think that's what we've got to remember. We cannot get disillusioned by setbacks. So technology and industry, they need to have the courage and the tenacity to meet these challenges. So we have to do something and technology will be the solution. So that I thought I'd end up with this one, which was Leonard Cohen died last year. And, um, and I think uh, this sums it up, you know, the ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. Uh, there's a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. And that's how we work with telehealth. And we, we, it's, we don't get it right first time, but we learn from what we do wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. So I think now we can um, open this uh, uh, open the session for your for your question. So are there any any questions from the from the audience? I should have said at the beginning that uh, on this webinar we have um, uh, you know the, the colleagues from South Norway, but also um, the colleagues from the University of Edinburgh. So yeah, please go ahead with your questions. It's a bit of silence, but there was a yeah. 
Stephanie? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, no, I just was wondering because the first study was um, patients with chronic long-term COPD, um, and I'm not sure what age bracket they were, and then the, the so it wasn't as successful from your findings. Um, and I'm just wondering, are those patients, um, because they have exacerbation so often, um, rarely do feel well and possibly miss the, their, the signs, the subtle signs of them getting worse? I think that's a real possibility. The, the group that we uh, investigated were very typical of people with COPD. So the average age was about 68, you know, around about two thirds had some form of uh, 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 other condition like blood pressure, diabetes or something like that. Um, they were a probably iller group than most. So uh, they had um, FEV or FEC of like 0. 0.4. So they, they, they were quite unwell. Um, so uh, I agree with you. One of the big difficulties that you saw from that uh, graph I showed was that quite a lot of people are kind of ill all the time and it is quite difficult, certainly using the systems that we were using to detect whether someone was becoming ill or not. And that was why I think we had to improve that. That's why we were looking at new ways and more subtle ways of assessing these signs. Um, and so the, the system that we used to improve the prediction also takes into account baseline factors. So um, how ill the person is, how frequently they're using their inhalers, um, how, um, uh, you know, whether they've been in hospital in the, in the previous six months. So when you took into account all of these other types of things, you, you were able to make a much more accurate prediction. And also it followed it in terms of temporal change. So um, it wasn't just a straightforward score, it looked at how score was changing as well. And by, by, by altering these things, we, we definitely were able to improve the predictivity of this, but this is not something that we've tested in another trial. These trials, as I'm sure you realize, are very, very expensive to set up, very hard to recruit to, and um, so it was, um, it's not something people do lightly. Great, thank you. Oh. Hello, Brian. Hello. Hi, it's Sun Finsley from the University of Agda. Thank you very much for your good presentation. I think oh. what you presented is in line with the experiences we had here in South Norway during the United Health project. And uh, your ideas of artificial intelligence is uh, more or less uh, the same as we are thinking in the future. Uh, you presented two different uh, studies, one of COPD, one of heart failure patients. Uh, in a new project, we are trying to look into patients with multimorbidity. Mm -hmm. And there, there, it, there will be some challenges with the kind of algorithms combining yeah. different uh, measurements and different symptoms. We saw from the United for Health that the questionnaire we asked the patients to fill in was symptom specific for COPD. And we experienced that the patients more or less uh, managed to understand their own symptom. That's uh, about empowerment and things like that, to understand mm -hmm. the system and uh, perhaps be able to take actions themselves, as you are saying, for the future. Uh, how, how can we manage to extend this for more uh, complex uh, situations, not only COPD, but combination of different diseases, to have a combination of a total kind of uh, daily behavior, daily question of how you feel, and a lot of measurements you should do, combining yeah. this and give the feedback to the patient himself for suggested kind of actions or change in medications and so on. Yeah. How do you think I, we can be able to develop such systems? I, I, I think it, there's, there's a real challenge there, but it's one that has to be addressed because most people over the age of 65 have more than one chronic condition. And so, um, you know, what we have done up until now is we've looked at specific conditions, just as you say, Rune, that, uh, and we've done that for ease of, of, of making, um, of, of doing trials. And although our, our condition, our patients actually had many other conditions, we, uh, and we didn't exclude anyone on the grounds of having another condition, we didn't monitor those conditions. So I absolutely agree with you that if you've got someone who, and it's not un, unrealistic that they have 
heart failure and COPD and diabetes. Um, you know, ma monitoring this is particularly difficult and it can be difficult, particularly when you've got a, a combination of something like heart failure and COPD, where the symptoms can be fairly similar, like becoming more breathless and um, it can be maybe difficult to work out what's going on in a patient like that. Um, I think the other thing we have to be very, very wary of is the burden that we put on patients in terms of uh, self-monitoring that we don't actually make their lives more difficult. I think people with COPD and, and to an extent with heart failure who do feel ill all the time have got more of an incentive to manage their uh, condition uh, than people with relatively asymptomatic conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, and it's, it would be unreasonable, I think, with high blood pressure and diabetes to expect people to monitor every day. Um, but it could well be that we, we would have patients with these complex conditions, we would have uh, some form of uh, rota that they are, are there, they're checking their different parameters on different days, not necessarily testing everything all the time. Um, but I think there is a real challenge in interpreting some of these data in some of these patients. Um, and I, I think that will be a bit of a challenge to AI, but um, it, uh, at the moment it's a, it's a challenge to human beings. I think you'd agree, Ren, if you've got someone with heart failure and COPD, sometimes to, to work out what's going on um, and to give advice in those. But I completely agree with you. It's an area we have to move ahead with and we have to experiment with. And I think the next big experiments in telehealth have to be in multi-morbid patients. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I totally agree with you and over experience. We are working on a paper right now. Uh, uh, roughly 70 or perhaps 75 percent of the patients uh, manage to make daily measurements. Yeah. And, and as, as you say, you cannot expect the patient to make measurements if they feel well. Yeah. And, and that will be a challenge for the artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms because you would need to have the days when I feel well to be able to predict when I'm having a worst condition. If you only have the worst condition uh, data set, it is yeah. difficult to predict the worst conditions uh, compared to a normal day. So, so to, who to be able to balance? Uh, yeah. We will need the data to be able to, to track differences. And at the same time, the patient needs to understand how important it will be to have the daily recordings, even if I'm feeling well. Yeah, yeah. I suppose if we make it very simple, you know, I'm feeling well today, and all, you know, the, the phone lights up and they've got one little thing where they open their phone, how are you today? I'm well, bang. And that's all they have to do. And if we can make the other measurements as inobtrusive as possible, and I think as technology improves, we may, we may be able to just detect a lot of this stuff just from one simple device that's worn all the time. And that they they don't even have to, they don't even have to actually measure anything. It would be um, it would be pretty good, you know, that respiratory rate could be measured just by sitting in front of a monitor, or um, it would be uh, while you're on your computer, or um, oxygen saturation measured by a watch that you're already wearing, or um, even blood pressure in some ways measured that way. At the moment, these technologies aren't available, but they may become available, and, and in which case life becomes much easier. You're not asking people to do very much at all. Um, thanks, Brian, and thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, kind of like move from uh, University of Aguilar also. Yeah. Uh, and um, following up on Rune's questions, uh, we are now involved in a new project, which is a follow-up of an earlier CPD project, where we have patients with, we'll be having patients with multimorbidity. Right. Uh, and we plan to use machine learning to right. uh, give better advice to the patients. Could you tell us a bit more about um, how you ran the machine learning? How do you develop the machine learning? Did you collaborate with anybody? Was it part yeah, of your yes. Yeah, well, we, we don't have the skills ourselves to do that. We, we worked with a company that was a spin out uh, company from the University of Edinburgh called Pharmacotics. Who had previously done uh, genetics, but they um, they uh, used the same techniques for COPD. So 
we, we're fortunate because one of the good things about telehealth is you have loads of data from patients. But interestingly, um, um, when we were trying to predict hospital admissions, there, there, there weren't enough hospital admissions really to produce. The, 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 the approach of artificial intelligence does require a large number of data points. And although there are plenty of exacerbations, there weren't that many admissions to hospital. So it was it was a little stymied by that. And I, I was trying um, for a little while there to persuade colleagues ar around Europe and the UK to um, combine data sets so that we could maybe do better work on this and that we could produce a combined anonymous, anonymized data set that we could all work on and develop um, uh, using it. Develop our own algorithms, but unfortunately, um, you know, I think everyone's pretty much thinking along these lines themselves and are not that keen on sharing data at the moment. We lost uh, hi -ha. Good, uh, thank you. Wow. Uh, well, do you think there's any possibility of collaborating with this company or with your group uh, for us I, in the future? I, 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 we would be delighted to do that actually we're looking for people um uh, with whom to collaborate so if, if offline we can have a chat about that that's great that's great okay i'll leave room for us too oh yeah there is one additional question from santiago santiago go ahead Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor McInstry, for a very illustrative uh, presentation. Uh, I am Santiago Martinez from the University of Agder in South Norway as well. And I would like uh, to ask you one question about the method. Um, you mentioned, I think it was about the COPD study where you compare true positive versus false positive. Um, yeah. I wonder is if you measure also false negative versus false negative? If um, yes, what was the rate? And if not, why not? Thank right, you. okay. I, I mean, I, you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to embarrass me here, Santiago, because that work was done by my colleague in pharmatics, but I am very happy to provide you with that information offline, if you like. So um, if you could send me an email, I'll get back to you with that. Um, because the, the, the way the system works, as I understand it, for this machine learning, is that it just looks at lots and lots and lots of different ways of combining data to it finds the one that is least likely to produce, um, uh, most likely to produce a positive result with the fewest number of negative results. But um, I, I would have to uh, get my colleague to provide you with the details on that. Great, thank you very much. Okay. There is um, also one more question from Rosanna. Hi, I'm Rosanna here from the Edinburgh eHealth course. Um, I just had a couple of questions in regards to the COPD study. Yeah. Um, you, know, you, you had those kind of patient populations where you correlated the um, antibiotic use and the sort of symptoms on the, on the score. Um, yep. and had that 25% who had infrequent exacerbations according to the symptom score, but very frequent antibiotic use. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just wondering in terms of how that, how that subpopulation compared from the intervention group to the control group, is there scope that rather than, you know, looking at this telemonitoring in order to, you know, treat patients earlier, that there's scope to actually use it to treat patients later. Um, are these patients who are taking unwarranted antibiotics and could we actually improve antimicrobial stewardship by reassuring them that they don't need to start antibiotics until you know, they're, they're flagging certain scores or symptom combinations? I think that's a really interesting question, Rosanna, one that we're looking at currently, because um, one of the things that we're particularly interested in, we're fairly confident that people giving these sorts of systems are taking more antibiotics than people who don't use these systems. And I think that um, it, it, it's fairly apparent that for some people taking these antibiotics wasn't making much difference. So 
one of the things we were interested in was were there are there patterns of presentation which would suggest that antibiotics are unlikely to make a difference so it's quite complicated this but we think again using machine learning we may be able to look at that to see are there patterns that seem to be associated with no improvement following antibiotic use or are there particular types of patient who do not seem to be um, or who seem to be using these drugs more frequently um, so that one, one of the advantages of these data is that they can be sliced in many different ways and I think that is a very important point and one that I, I'm very interested in could we could we come up with a situation where we can say that you know this is a situation where you should take steroids not antibiotics or uh, or take nothing, wait two days, see what happens. I think that that, that would be a very interesting uh, um, piece of work. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Um, and, and the second part of the question kind of on a similar vein, um, that, you know, my experience in working in hospital where you have the observation chart and there's an early warning score that's calculated from that, um, yeah, the threshold to call the doctor is a score of four and we just get an inordinate number of calls for a score of three because you know the number's going up we want to let you know they're nearly at four um, and so then you have to sort of once they've been referred to you you've got to kind of assess the situation and see are they deteriorating and so forth um, and you know obviously this study didn't show a cost efficiency and and in trying to demonstrate cost efficiency, not only are you trying to improve the effect, but also to decrease the cost. Um, and, you know, obviously your data was showing that patients in the intervention group were accessing healthcare more altogether. Um, are there, you know, are there strategies for trying to reduce those patients who all of a sudden are getting all this data that they're not used to seeing and are uh, you know, sort of jumping the gun or getting a bit nervous and increasing their services unnecessarily? Like, are, are there strategies to combat that? I, I think one, one of the difficulties is that, um, you know, the, in, in this, this, the way this worked was that um, someone was checking these data every day and they've contacted the patient if the patient had a high level. The patients were also called told to get in touch with the uh, clinician in the routine way if, if they felt unwell. But um, a large number of these contacts were because th the patient's scores went high. And it wasn't that the patients were necessarily anxious. <clears throat> it was just that their score was a little higher than was five or more. And so the people got in touch with them. Now, the problem is that um, some of these questions are quite difficult for people to understand. And although we spent a long time with some people on them, you'd get people who would say that they were more breathless than usual every single day, you know? And so uh, it, was, it was quite difficult. Um, for people like that, the systems don't work. So um, it, one of the things that we, we felt we learned from this was that, um, that if you were going to use telehealth, you would give a trial, you would try and educate people how to use it. And if after a few weeks it was clear that they just weren't getting it uh, then you, you should withdraw it you know um, because occasionally people will always be symptomatic and you'll get a group of people who cannot discern a change in, in symptoms and that that group for them this system doesn't work thank you thank you very much so are there any Last questions. Still have a few minutes left. If if not, then um, I just would really like to thank a lot, Brian, for 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 the presentation, and we will definitely share the slides uh, uh, for your information. And uh, yeah, if there is any follow up and you need to facilitate the contact, then just please. Uh, get in touch so that we can provide you with either Brian's details or, or, um, or the details of other participants. So thank you very much um, again for, for your time and for your participation and uh, looking forward to further collaboration with all of you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you for University of Argo for great presentation. I hope to be able to be in touch later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you all.